How's everyone doing? Good morning. So uh, about two years ago, I came up with this crazy idea. This is a passion project for me. You know, this is something that is interesting and um, pretty in my curiosity gets, uh, you know, I perk my ears whenever I start thinking about fractals and stuff like that. What I will not be talking about, I am not going to pretend to be a quantum physics expert. I am not going to get into any woo-woo science. In fact, when I pitched this idea to Aaron Bytesdale, he looked at me like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, it's like, yeah, no, no, I am actually going to talk about randomness and fractals and, and like how they present in our environment and how can we use them, you know? So what are these random patterns that randomly appear and do things to us and are useful and can be tools. Uh, we're going to talk about like fractal adaptations that are present in nature, you know, and, um, and then I'm going to bring it back and, and I'm going to theoretically discuss how these ideas are added to my lifestyle and how I've been using this randomness to create robustness or anti-fragility. Because there is this trend in, um, in the health sphere that we are these snowflakes that are very fragile and we wouldn't be here flying from across the United States and, and you know, other countries and watching this presentation over fiber optics and cables if we were fragile. I believe, and this is a personal philosophy, that we are here because we're adaptable and we are robust. So no more of that, oh my God, my thyroid. What am I going to do to, to help it? No, it's what are we going to do to help our condition and move on so we can enjoy life? Because in the end, that's what it's all about. So having dinner with Chris Masterjohn and then later on, uh, you know, a drink with my, my, my friend Ben, um, we were talking about energy and how energy prices and energy security are going to be a huge problem, huge problem in the future. Energy prices are climbing. Um, and by environmental changes are preventing us from uh, using energy or uh, are going to have catastrophic effects on the environment. And we're constantly trying to find uh, sources of renewable energy. Okay, for example, um, solar panels, you know, the sun gives us a lot of free energy and, um, and we can use, harness this energy to protect ourselves from future price increases, maybe sometimes even sell back energy. Uh, but these solar panels kind of present with a lot of problems. Um, for example, there, there's always that efficiency problem. How can we solve and how can we harness more, more energy from the sun and be a little bit more uh, effective and increase productivity. Well, some scientists decided to arrange these panels in a fractal pattern. The circuitry and the, and the arrangement of these of this panels, and they found out that when you arrange these solar panels in a way that we perceive as random, it increases its efficiency in photosensitivity and production of energy. And then it also solved a second problem that we might have, but we might not notice, that solar panels are ugly. <laughs> Who wants to see solar panels? But arranging these solar panels in a way that was more efficient to harness this energy also increased the, the appeal of that solar panel. How cool is that? It's like, so, so what, what, what is this fractal pattern? You know, so a fractal pattern is this recursively created, never-ending um, pattern that 
It happens in nature over and over. There's so many examples. And, and why is it happening? Why do we keep encountering? And it's because it's more effective. And then when we study these fractal patterns and the geometry of these fractal patterns, we can use this, uh, these patterns to increase robustness, to increase uh, effectiveness of other things from computer processing, creation of energy, aesthetics. How can we use that for our health? But, you know, it's like almost like nature figured out that having a fractal pattern is good for photosynthesis <laughs> because this is what succulents do. They propagate in this fractal pattern, almost like they evolved to do this. And they're pretty. Who keeps succulents at their house? You know? And they're robust. Don't water them too much, though, because this is what my succulents look like. So this is my actual succulents. Uh, I got this as my 40th birthday present. I have, I have a brown thumb. No pun intended. I do. I cannot grow. <laughs> I, I cannot grow plants, you know. But succulents, you know, they 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 help me, you know. But yeah. So I bring the succulents. I wanted to take another hobby, you know. Uh, in in and now my environment is a little bit prettier. And now I have something that I can look at, and you know, and I know, you know, that it's uh, there because of evolution and its robustness and how it created, you know, it, in the environment. But even for children, just putting plants in their environment increases um, mental health. It decreases disorders of uh, adolescence in, into adulthood. And it's not like you know, we need to take our children and, and, and live in the middle of uh, the, the, the Pacific Northwest and you know, no. Just a simple act of bringing a couple of potted plants into the adjacent environment helps renature us. And it also helps adults. It reduces violence in prisons. It reduces incidents of suicide. Just having a little plant. But why? You know? It's maybe because these fractal patterns are pretty. And why are they pretty? When we study Pollock's paintings and we do um, computer analysis of, of the patterns that he used, and it's not like Pollock was actively trying to create this factor. Maybe he was. But it, was, it, it makes us look at the picture, and it increases our interest in this painting. It makes our eyes kind of look at the whole thing, and it makes us like enjoy this painting. And maybe why th this is why these paintings have, you know, uh, been around in, in, in uh, over many many years. This abstract looking pa abstract looking paintings that are kind of like in the back of our head are really appealing. So are they really abstract? You know, uh, and maybe uh, it it. That's why he, you know, he, he's so famous, and, and, and we like his paintings. You know, maybe by using these fractal patterns, or maybe it's because evolution has taught us to use fractal patterns. For example, albatross, when they hunt in low, in areas of low food, they use fractal pa uh, flight paths, Levi paths, for foraging success, and this. Fractal patterns increase the chances that the albatross is actually going to find food. Are these fractal patterns part of us? Well, maybe because the hats I use the same Levi patterns when they're looking for food, when they're foraging, completely endogenous to us. No one is teaching us this. These fractal patterns that are beautiful, these fractal patterns that are efficient. These fractal patterns are helping us evolve. And when I say that they are endogenous to us, they are endogenous to us. For example, 
the bronchial uh, trees grow in fractal patterns to increase surface area for gas exchange. So this little self-repeating tree-like you know, uh, shapes are repeating and repeating and repeating, and we can pack about 75 square, square meters of surface area in a six liter volume. That's, you know, so for uh, people that are not familiar with metric, uh, four liters is about a gallon. So just imagine, 75 square meters. It, you know, it, it, it was used to say that, oh, it's about the size of a tennis court. It's not quite that big, it's half, half a tennis court. But yeah, uh, so these fractal patterns really have helped us evolve. We are here, and that oxygen exchange, like Dr. Lasty was talking about uh, uh, yesterday, is possible because of this efficiency. For example, neurons grow in fractal patterns. When we are little, we don't have nerve endings, and as those nerve endings grow, they grow in this fractal-like patterns, and they extend and they extend, and the ones that are beneficial persist. And that's how we start walking. And this, um, this wiring economy saves us energy, and it's very efficient at connecting the things that we need to connect. And it's being studied to use this type of uh, uh, economy of, um, of growth to wire supercomputers and to wire you know, different networks because it's so efficient and it's been resolved already. Okay, so enough. You know. So, okay, so fractals are important. Cool. How can we apply this robustness principles into our health, okay? So where's the mismatch, okay? So maybe, maybe CrossFit had it right. You know, they used to uh, teach uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the specialization is for insects. And, and I agree with that, you know? You are not going to be able to lift uh, 500 pounds on a deadlift by specializing in marathon running, you know? Uh, maybe we need to be more open to introducing random types of exercise into our, into our routines, like primal play, like um, you know, some of the movement sessions that we've had here uh, during the weekend. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong, there's a big difference between exercising and training, and we should always aim to train. Who's ever heard someone that said, oh, you know, I'm just going to the gym and I'm just going to, you know, just going on the treadmill and for a couple of minutes and then I'm just going to do a couple of curls. You know, that's, that's exercising. That's useless. We should always try to have a training goal. What's your goal? You know, it could be, you know, getting stronger. It could be getting more flexible. It could be um, being more resilient, more robust. And then selecting a strategy to achieve that goal and using as many forms of training that are going to help you achieve, uh, achieve that goal. Okay, who can recognize this next picture? You guys, you guys know what that is? <laughs> That's the thermostat at the, uh, at the dorms. <laughs> we live at 73 degrees. <laughs> Constantly comfortable. There's no randomness. We're never uncomfortable. I keep walking out of here because I'm cold. <laughs> we need to introduce randomness into our environment. We live in too much comfort. This is making us fragile. You know, how can we introduce some cold exposure? Kurt over here, you know, he, uh, he's going to start doing cold showers now. Yeah. It, <laughs> We're, we need to expose ourselves to sauna therapy. We need to, you know, uh, be comfortable being uncomfortable. Sauna exposure is very necessary, not just because we want to look tan, you know, not just because we need vitamin D. In fact, in my practice, 
if you have an overt vitamin D deficiency, you know, I might recommend vitamin D. But we forget that when we receive the sunlight into our skin, there are so many side chains, side reactions that are happening that are creating other things that we haven't even studied, other things that we don't even know. And we are completely bypassing because we want to see a number on a paper that says you're above 40. And we, and, and we achieve it, and then that's it, are we done? No, we need to include you know, some of this temperature exposure, this random, this randomness into our lifestyle. Um, circadian rhythm uh, dysregulation. This is a tough one because you know, we have shift workers. We need shift, we need people to be at hospitals 24 seven. And how do we help our friends that are doing this um, be able to have a little bit of changing and, and have a little bit of um, uh, more variability? You know, we know that we have to wake up with the sun. We know that we should go to sleep at night. You know, but it, it's just um, it's just very difficult because of the society we live in. You know, waking up with an alarm clock. In, in a perfect environment, and we do not live in a perfect environment, we should strive to try to wake up when we wake up. But, you know, I had to be here at 11 o'clock for this presentation, so I had to set up an alarm this morning. Uh, and then staying up late, you know, I do not want any of my patients to ever tell me that, uh, that you know, oh, my kid had strep throat, so I had to tell him, you know what, uh, sorry, dude, I got to protect my uh, circadian rhythm. I'll see you tomorrow morning, you know, when the sun uh, rises. Uh, you know, take care of yourself. Peace. No, no. We are here. We are here not to see who takes the most supplements, not, not to see who's the most primal. We're here to enjoy life. We're here to be the part of this community and be a productive member of this community. And sometimes you go out and you have an excellent dinner and you stay up late drinking a little bit of wine. And sometimes, you know, it's going to be time to double down and do the things that we do. But we have become so regimented in trying to be perfect that if we um, end up, you know, oh, staying past 11, oh my goodness, that's going to crater me for uh, the next month. And that's not robust. Maybe staying up with your kid overnight, yeah, you're gonna be tired, sorry. But maybe you can recover from that tiredness because you have that adaptability after two or three days, not two or three months. And then heart rate variability. Okay, so sympathetic, very steady heart rhythm, boom. Boom, 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 boom. When we're rested, when we're parasympathetic, we see our little random heart rate. Boom, 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 boom. Why? Because we're in sympathetic mode. Our brain doesn't trust our peacemaker to keep the, you know, the heart beating. So it starts releasing cortisol, epinephrine, and all of this excitatory pro, uh, uh, compounds to keep that steady heart rate because it doesn't trust it. When we're nice and relaxed, when we're rest and digest, you know, um, our, heart, our brain trusts our heart. And now this random variable heart rhythm occurs. But we are so addicted to all these numbers. You know, my hour ring, when I first got it, I was waking up and the first thing I, I would look at it was like, HRV, what's my, what's my HRV? And that would send me into sympathetic mode. <laughs> so instead of me listening to my body and be more intuitive and decide, okay, I feel pretty damn good today. Let me check what my HRV is. Or, you know what, I feel like crap. I was letting the data dictate my day. What about diet? You know, we talk a lot about diet, you know. Raise your hand if you have an intermittent fasting uh, alarm. Okay, erase it. Get rid of it. 
You know, it's a great tool, but intermittent fasting, we should listen to our body and decide, you know, what time should we start eating, learn to be hungry. Now, it's a great tool for someone that's never done it, you know, and then looking at that clock, you know, tick down and then doing it, you know. But you got to remember that fasting doesn't happen as an on-off switch. You know, there's plenty of research on fasting mimicking diets where you're constantly eating throughout the day and you still activate maybe not 100% of the mechanisms that benefit us from fasting, but maybe 85, 90% of them. So we need to let go of that. Oh, my God, it's 15 uh, hours and 58 minutes, two more, and I'll start eating. You know, it does not happen. It happens on a spectrum. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, diet restrictions, you know, and I have a lot of patients that suffer from orthorexia, being so regimented about their uh, their problems. And listen, um, diet saved my life. It changed my course of my life. And I, I, I'll, 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 I have a little bit of orthorexia. I think you know, I'm, you know, I can, I can uh, disclose that, you know, um, but aiming to increasing the variety of our food, aiming to having more things coming in, to increase robustness. You know, I don't want to dive, you know, or, or be defeated by a Brussels sprout. <laughs> they are special cases, you know, I would never suggest that someone with a disease like alcoholism should be able to drink every once in a while, of course not. You know, and there are people with true debilitating problems that can be caused by oxalates or many different things, um, and 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 uh, they're going to be unable. But you know, the goal should always be to increase the amount of uh, variety in our food to create robustness. You know, uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Kenneth Profrock, told me um, that his prescription for probiotics. So you do your research and get the best 10 probiotics and the 10 worst probiotics. And then take the first one, number one first, finish the bottle and then grab the worst list and then do the worst probiotic and then go back and forth and have a lot of variety because we want that variety in our, in, in our digestive system. And I don't know, like the common thread throughout this presentation, I think it's talking about like hormesis. You know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, being comfortable uh, in an uncomfortable environment, increasing that robustness. You know, we are creatures of habit. We like predictability. You know, there was a study where um, people were sent to war, and uh, one cohort was told, you're coming back in three months. The other cohort was, was told, you're coming back. The cohort that had a deadline had less incidence of PTSD than the cohort that had an open deadline, even if they stayed less time. We like that predictability. We, we want to know, you know, Maslow's you know, um, uh, hierarchy. But we should be okay and we should be robust enough to every once in a while be able to step out of that health box, be able to kind of push our limits, not only physically, mentally, emotionally, everything. You know, it's okay to cry. Uh, for us to be able to increase that endogenous robustness. You know, so ah, over the past month, you know, like thinking about this presentation, I was like, what the hell am I going to do with this? You know, how am I going to prescribe robustness to my patients? It, it's crazy, you know. Um, because it's, there's no pill. You know, maybe if I can tell my patients, you know, yeah, you got to be uncomfortable with temperature and, and on certain situations and then going, going to bed with the sun and maybe staying up sometimes, you know. Maybe have a little bit, a little bit of bad food every once in a while, you know, um, like a s'more. <laughs> and maybe having temperature dysregulation and then taking a cold shower. Maybe we need to start prescribing more camping. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Okay, so um, let's play a little game. Whoever gives me the best question, question gets a, bo a box of element. It has to be a question, though. Okay, it has to be a question, right? Yeah. What's your middle name? Uh, my middle name is Guadalupe. Good, good. Yeah. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Um, so, at, so your talk really spoke to me, you know, the idea of randomness and hormesis. I'm, I'm uh, you know, we're, we're kindred souls. One thing you said was really interesting about fasting, and that is not to do it on a regular basis and to mix it up. There's a hormone called ghrelin, which is kind of the meal timing hormone. And if you eat very regularly, it comes up like clockwork, you know, yeah. half an hour before meal time, and it tells you, oh, got to eat. And they've done studies with dogs and humans where they put them on three meals a day or six meals a day. The ghrelin adapts. So I take your advice and kind of try to randomize my eating times so that I'm not doing that. And it really suppresses cravings because your, your body has sort of extinguished this ghrelin response. So have you uh, looked at the hormonal responses to randomizing uh, I, it, I'm a chronic activities. faster. Yeah. I'm a chronic, we, were, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Uh, I do very well with like 16 .8 or even OMAD. You know, I, I, I tell my patients that I can fast like a motherfucker. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's very easy to fast. Uh, when I've done fasting mimicking diets, the moment I put one of those crackers in my mouth, I'm ravenous for the rest of the day. You know, so, so in my randomness, sometimes I'll have breakfast. You know, like maybe once or twice a month, you know, but I do much better with fasting. So it's not an all absolute, all or nothing or whatever, you know, it's more to me in my own personal health is, you know, every once in a while, not, never planning a cheat. When you plan a cheat, I'm going to cheat next Saturday. You'd throw the baby out with the bathwater. But if you are in L.A. and you're walking down the street and at the farmer's market, you see some gluten free crepes. You know, I'm just going to have some, you know, and add that randomness into my day. Now, if I'm on like body fat, body, body fat, you know, cut, you know, and I'm, and I'm counting my macros and whatever, I've made a contract with myself that I'm going to do something for eight weeks. I'm not going to add randomness. I'm going to stick to my plan because that's the part of training, you know, but I'm not on a forever diet. You know, I allow myself to have periods of expansion and periods of, you know, uh, where I'm like, you know, I, I got a presentation, man, you know, I got to lose a couple of weights, yeah, so. But, but to put this randomness into your schedule, do you, are you just completely spontaneous? Completely spontaneous. Okay, so I you don't, don't you I don't, don't plan my spontaneousness. <laughs> All right, very cool. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot. Oh, what, what kind of what kind of medicine do you what kind of practice do you have? I, I, use I like my, do my patients uh, and stuff. I, I do uh, uh, nat naturopathic endocrinology. Wow. Yeah, and I I have a, uh, I specialize in endocrinology or hormones. Yeah. Where, where's your practice? Um, it's at gohealth a t g o health dot com, and yeah. if you go there, you know I can give you a, a, a free meet and greet. You know, so you can see what I do. Arizona. Yeah, in You're Arizona. In Arizona. Okay. Yeah. I do telehealth, yeah. Just because I want a chance at that box. <laughs> could, could you describe the crystal structure of element and describe whether it is or is not a fractal or to what degree it might be a fractal? <laughs> I, I cannot describe the crystal stu structure of element, you know, but that's a good question for the nerdiest question of, you know. The, yeah. So, um... In a way, what you're describing is balance. You're sort of <clears throat> through your, essentially like what I, what I hear you saying is there is a time to be regimented, there is a time to not be regimented. How do you, and, and so essentially 
in order to describe what that balance is, you still have to find where your own center is so that you can sort of see, from my understanding, like what, what, is, what is the extreme on both ends, therefore what's the middle? So how do you define that for yourself? Um, the, so HRV is a very good indicator for mm -hmm. that, you know, and, and uh, the, the, the more stressed out I am, the more I can uh, go, become a little bit more regimented, you know. Uh, during high periods of stress, you know, I try to not drink. There is nothing healthy about alcohol. It is fun as hell, you know, and, and I, I enjoy whiskey. But if during a stressful situation, I am not going to add that stressor into my life. You know, during uh, medical school, during boards, you would hear people like, oh, I'm so stressed, I'm going to have some Ben and Jerry's. When I'm, I was that stressed, that's when I went like whole 30. I was like, I, I, I got to stay up and I got to study. I am going to buffer all of that stress by eating better. And the more relaxed we are, we can allow more of these stressors to come into our life and, you know, and, and be part of us. But yeah, and, and it, it's the same with the spectrum of health. I'm not going to suggest that someone with cancer should be loosey-goosey and have, you know, a s'more every once in a while. No, you have to be more regimented, you know. Uh, but someone that has really good health that feels optimal should spend that health and enjoy life a little bit more. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I was just going to ask if the element box has varying levels of electrolytes in each package. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they're pretty standardized. <laughs> um, so with your patients, do you introduce that randomness after um, you've seen some remission from symptoms, or do you try to experiment during that time period as well? Uh, you know, um, in, the, in, in the art of medicine, you know, we want to eliminate as many variables as possible. So there are going to be stretches of time where I'm going to ask my patient, hey, let's try gluten-free for 30 days. And there's no cheating. You know, what goes from the plate to your mouth, it's not a cheat, it's a decision. Mm -hmm. And if you're making that contract with yourself, let's do it for 30 days. And now we've eliminated a variable, you know? Uh, I, I, in my practice, I tend to take people off of supplements more often than adding supplements. Guess how many supplements my average patient takes in a day? 17. Is that robust? Having, I, I don't take any prescription medications, but I do have a pill counter for all the 17 different supplements. So we take away things, in, introduce a little bit of more uh, standardization, remove variables, and then little by little, we add what we need. And the healthier you are, the more wider you can start having maybe a keto brownie every once in a while. But if you come, you, if you come to me to lose weight, no, you're not going to be randomly eating keto snacks. No, we need to standardize things, and, but not forever, never forever. Just one thing. I already know your name. So, <laughs> what is your quest? What was that? What is your quest? Oh my goodness. <laughs> now you're courting uh, Monty Pine. I oh. mean, <laughs> George and Sarah were asking us yesterday, and you know, most of us did it already in four minutes. So, M my quest, as in. Oh, my call. What's my your, call. What's your calling and your motivation to, to do be, what okay. you do? Yeah, I, you know, so I, my past presentations were about viruses and bacteria and using herbs to kill. Go back to 2017. I was talking about coronaviruses and I was talking about monkeypox. Go back, 2017. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then um, Megan uh, uh, told me, you didn't go to school to treat Petri dishes. You went to school to treat people. And... I doubled down and now I'm practicing, you know, but, uh, but it, so, so viruses and bacteria and herbs are cool and that's my hobby, but my calling is healing people. Hi, great talk. Thank you. Um, I'm curious if there's ever a time where you actually find that you have to prescribe to a patient the opposite, more order, 
because, for example, for me to stay on track, you know, a lot of the times it's easier for me to eat the same salad every day. I've totally. meal prepped it for the whole week. And if I start adding that variation into my schedule, I'll fall off the rails a lot easier. And so is there ever a time where you kind of have to get the ball rolling with order before they can let in the chaos? Yes, um, I'm a big fan of um, regimentation and having uh, systems, tons of systems in my house. Uh, like for example, uh, lights go on when I go into a certain area, lights shut off and change in you know, color at, at, at a certain time according to the, the sun setting. Uh, all of my shirts match my pants. And so I don't have to make a decision of what I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna wear. I can just grab whatever. Uh, when I go to work, I park at the same spot because my job depends on decision making. And there is something called decision fatigue. And you, you've experienced that. You, know, you wake up in the morning, oh, what are we having for dinner? And then as the day progresses, it's like, what are we having for the, uh, what do we have? Ah, well, let's overeat. Because you are fatigued of making decisions. So yes, having, uh, having structure is very important, okay? And, and creating those habits. And what, once those habits set, and once you're more comfortable in your own skin, and when you're, once you're saving, saving that health and putting it into that bank account, at a certain point, I am going to ask my, pa uh, my patients to spend some of that health. But yeah, yeah, yeah it's especially with eating disorders, um, it's very fine line between being regimented and triggering. So, so it's very important to, as a practitioner, any practitioners here, to identify that even within our health uh, groups, there's a lot of eating disorders and we need to make sure, be aware that we're not triggering them and we are actually helping and not, you know, because my patients do whatever the hell I ask them to and it can be very dangerous. Uh, Dr. Ruiz, uh, might you prescribe uh, a variable a number of whiskeys that I have <laughs> cheat at? More than one. <laughs> Thank you.